Good evening. Um, I'm, I'm Philip Boyle. I, I do appear on these screens occasionally, uh, but this evening uh, I'm here to do the introduction because our chair, John Forrest, uh, is away somewhere in Central Europe, up a mountain in a hut somewhere. Um, uh, so you've got me doing the introducing. Um, tonight, um, first thing I want to say is, uh, originally this event was planned to be done as a coordinated uh, live event and, and, and a Zoom one, um, but because of the conditions about traveling, we really thought uh, it was unfair to drag people out into the heat and into the basement of, of uh, ABA. So we're, uh, we're here on Zoom only, and I apologize for that, and I'm glad you're all here. And it's the people who aren't here, I suppose, that <laughs> I should speak concerned. Anyway, um, tonight's uh, main speaker is Professor Judy Loach, who is one of the longest um, serving members of our working party, has been chair for co-chair initially with James, who's here tonight, uh, and then chair of Dr. Moma for, for a number of years. She is one of our foremost modern academics. It was, she did pioneering work, uh, interviewing nearly all the employees in Corbusier's office while they were still around. And also in researching uh, um, uh, in, in Lyon, um, the, the, ho the housing scheme there by, by Corbusier and getting that, that, that publicized. Um, so, but she has spent quite a bit of time in, in, in Italy uh, and um, we have long wanted to get to grips with the rationalists because it's a, a period uh, sort of further away in knowledge really than it is in space and time. Uh, but she has been there and she does know it well. Uh, and so she's going to give an, an overview um, after which I'm going to talk about a few of uh, Tirani's buildings. So without more ado, let's, Judy, let's get you, get you going. And now I share my screen, don't I? Yes. And that's not happened. She there? Yes, I've shared my screen. Uh, I know. It worked before. I'll go back to that now then. Did everybody just see me? No. Should I unshare mine? Yeah, I think so, probably. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you should. Uh, As, no, no, that's got my top back. Yeah, oh, right, no. Let's try something. Sorry, I've done it wrong. This will stop other screen. Yes, I do want to continue doing that. Yup. Stop share. Um, share screen. Yeah, I've done that. It's saying desktop one. Do I do that? Okay. Oh, share down at the bottom again. Yes, yes oh, there, we go. there we go. Um, I'm not seeing my PowerPoint. Uh, you have to open PowerPoint. Um, go down to the little P in the bottom right hand corner. Oh, right. So yeah. That's it, click that. Try again, double click it. Uh, there we go. Um, no, no, that's on something. Oh, that's right, that's right. No, that's on yeah. then click on the thing. Double click. Is yeah, that full, yeah. full screen? Yeah, okay, fine. Just a moment. Um, yeah, okay. Have you got it there now? Yes. Right, fine. Super duper. Right, fine. Well, it's obviously our last attempt to, to try and lure some of you off to Milan with us in September, October. Um, and here we see um, a map of Italy with up at the top there, Milan and, oh, I can do this, can't I? Milan and Turin or Torino and Como. And we can see they're very close to, they're very much in Northern Italy, they're very close to France, to Switzerland, to Austria, and even to Germany. In fact, closer to all of those places than to Rome. And I think that's a very important thing to take in into account. And this is where rationalism takes off. So it's taking off in what's a very industrial, uh, thanks to hydroelectric uh, coming down from the Alps and commercial region. And therefore it's more forward thinking than down in Rome. And it's more outward looking because it's so close to these other countries as well. And it comes under their influence and it influences them. And particularly here between Milan, Como and Switzerland, 
it's Italian speaking Switzerland, it's Ticino. So there's a lot of back and forth there, um, right the way through. And because it's uh, a place which um, has a lot of industry and has a lot of commerce going on in it, it has enough money to enable it to build from the 1860s onwards. Italy only really exists from 18, as a state from 1860, 1861, and already very quickly, the um, power of, of Milan as the commercial and industrial center is shown with the building of, uh, above all, the gal famous Galleria, iron and glass, and um, very much a state status symbol and that. Um, but just in passing, let's mention that Turin, Torino, is also, also very important to the state. In fact, that is the initial capital of Italy in the very first few years of the state of Italy. Um, it had already been the capital of Savoy, an independent state beforehand, um, and it also was important industrially. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the, the slides, please. Yeah. Um, and that's why we find that it's um, particularly a center for engineering, um, producing domestic machines, such as sewing machines, but also very well known for producing motor cars and perhaps most um, famously for the building of the Fiat fa Lingotto factory at Mirafiori on the edge of Turin in um, the, around the period of the First World War, a, a very um, go ahead building for that period. And here you see the helicoidal ramp up which you drove um, the vehicles. They were, they were being constructed on the various floors and then they would be led up to the next floor for the next stage in the process. And then they were tried out on the racetrack on the roof. Um, but Turin was also very much the center of printing and publishing. The Stamper, one of the major newspapers pu published there, international connections as a result of that. One of the biggest publishing houses, Einaudi, um, published uh, amongst others, the great publisher of Vitale Combino, and perhaps partly because of its proximity to France, a great center for food and drink, coffee, chocolate, vermouth, um, and very much therefore a cafe culture from early on. And that's partly why you get a lot of these political conversations going on and why it's from there that the Risorgimento, the movement for the creation of the state of, it of Italy takes off um, from 1860 onwards. And it's also a big center for cinema from the 1890s onwards, perhaps again, because it's proximity to France, to Lyon, etc. But Milan, um, as the capital of Lombardy, very much um, becomes known as uh, the, it makes its name as, it concretizes it as the capital of industry and commerce, particularly from 1881, when this national exhibition is held in uh, Milan. Um, and uh, it show, it's a possibility of showing off its industry, which is based on the production of machines, but often associated with the, the very primary industry of Milan, which is textiles. Um, and from textiles, we get fashion coming out as well. Um, and from machines, well, if um, Torino was best known for, for um, cars and motor vehicles of that sort, um, Milan was a big center for motorbike uh, production. Um, but above all, it was a center for commerce, for banking and for business. Um, and it's not surprising, therefore, amongst the machines that get created there, are typewriters from very early on. And again, it's a printing and publishing centre. Uh, Corriere della Sera, the other main daily newspaper comes out of there. Again, international connections through that. And publishers, Elector, which we all know is a great publisher of architectural books, and one that we're going to come across ourselves, we'll be visiting um, their premises, Herkley. Um, just in passing, let me mention um, Como, just to, to point out how that's linked. That is also, we now think of it as sort of a rather polite place, a place where it, it's sort of more a, a resort, but it was actually a major industrial center for textile, but the textile that it specialized in there was silk, so it's rather upmarket, rather luxury. Um, it was also quite an intellectual center, although it's quite a small place, and above all, it was a center, a center for Italian abstract painters um, and who very much looked to Matilda Geica um, in the interwar period 
into the golden section. I mention that now because I'm not going to mention Como really later, because it's a stream of thinking that will percolate back into Como, uh, into Milan, and into rationalism. There's a belief there underlying Geica that the golden section was the underlying principle of Mediterranean culture. And that that is therefore a means by which you can link modern architecture with classical so-called Mediterranean tradition without imitating specific forms within that tradition. So I show you here um, a mural by Mario Radice, who is the main, uh, the leading art artist painter in that movement. And that painting was an entire mural, a whole wall of the director's office inside the Casa del Fascio. We will not see that mural because of course, for good political reasons, given that, you know, Mussolini has such a starring role in that mural that disappeared. So going back to Milan and Torino, um, in the late 19th century, they're both dominated by a bourgeois, nouveau riche um, clientele rather than aristocracy. And these people, because they, they're, they're nouveau riche, they're new money, they're prepared to break with tradition, leave classical, classical style behind, and they go very much to Art Nouveau. So that it's a sort of an irony in that because they're coming out of industry, they go for nature and the vegetal. Um, but at the same time, they're very interested in making the most possible of the new materials, the industrially produced ones, iron, steel, um, which allows larger openings in walls, um, glass, including stained glass, mosaic, terrazzo, ter terracotta, um, using cement for um, casting ornamentation. Um, and bringing in also new technologies, artificial lighting and central heating and lifts. And as soon as you bring lifts in, you can build higher for blocks of flats. And this, it helps with your increasing urban density, not least in Milan, because you are still within two rings of fortifications. Um, and there was enough money to do this too. So you get rather high standard of things. Around 1900, um, Italian Art Nouveau takes off and it's called Liberty, Liberty style. And that is named after the London Liberty B department store, which was mainly importing stuff from Japan and that kind of thing. Um, and we see that already um, Italian modernism is very colorful compared with what we get elsewhere. And in 1906, there is an international, an Exposition Universale, and sorry, an international expo held in Milan, um, which is partly to, come to uh, celebrate the fact there's now a direct Paris-Milan railway line. Um, and so again, the international aspect of Milan, as opposed to any other city in uh, Italy. Um, and um, these, the, and, uh, the two main art architects have been the two that we saw on the previous screen, but you can see this sort of thing is not very well received by the avant-garde. It's sort of, it's not exactly what they wanted as modern architecture, but this is a very successful exhibition. If the national exhibition in 1881 um, had attracted one and a half million visitors, mainly from Italy, this great exhibition in, uh, um, in 1906 attracted over 10 million visitors. So it was a really major uh, international event. And it was held in the Sempione Park, which will eventually become, it is still the site of the main site of the Milan Triennale. Um, so this seemed a very escapist vision to the avant-garde in Italy. So what happens in reaction to that is futurism um, which begins pre-World War I around 1909, but it re initially it's poets and painters rather than architects. It's the perception of the modern city as vibrant and dynamic and a positive celebration of speed and noise. Um, and seeing this kind of imagery that goes with that as more appropriate than nature. The imagery of the racing car, the aeroplane, the motorbike. And of course, once we get to um, moving over towards architecture, Marinetti's very provocative manifestos um, and these images which are very fractured, uh, Boccioni, really almost cubist. Um, and the 
architectural manifestations of this are late. And Sant'Elia's Cita Nuova is not published until 1914. So the period of futurism in architecture is really hardly there at all because the First World War breaks out at that point and most of the futurists are killed in that war, including Sant'Elia. And um, this is not something which goes down well with the client basis of the client base of these nouveau riche um, businessmen, etc. So immediately after the First World War, there is a conservative reaction to this, particularly from about 1922 onwards, a reaction at once to the chaos of futurism and the chaos of the First World War. And this reaction is called Novecento, which is, is Italian for 20th century. And initially, this is something which takes off in painting with um, painters like Sirioni and De Chirico, um, painting a lot of urban scenes, but painting them in a very still, frozen, ordered kind of way, um, the opposite of what we've been seeing with the futurists. Um, this, one of the wonderful irons, this whole series of them going through this, but one of the irons is that one of the, the, the um, founding patrons of this movement was a woman called Margarita Safati, who was Jewish, but who was also a founder of, of the fascist party and indeed was, was Mussolini's mistress. Um, and uh, Novicento is very much looking back to classicism in order to find order and logic and formalism as against the, the chaos of what's been going on before. And they're very much also um, going back to this myth of the Mediterranean, uh, of Mediterranean civilization and of Italy's role in that. And um, therefore seeing that as a possibility of finding timeless rather than some kind of historicist background into which to root yourself. Um, in architecture, this takes off, the leading figure would be Giovanni Muzio, um, who's a figure who's really worth looking at. And Giancarlo Di Carlo felt that this was the architect who was most neglected and should be most looked at by architects coming to um, Milan, interesting point. Um, and in the interwar period, he's probably best known for Karl Bruta, these big monumental buildings, which are part of creating cityscape as well. Um, very nice way of doing corner. Um, and part of, at the same time, this typology of um, very large apartment blocks, quite high rise for the period. And then um, post-war, we get these buildings like the Angelicum, um, which is a, a building for the Dominicans. And when I first walked past that, not knowing who it was by or anything, I thought, I didn't realize Aldo Rossi had built here um, because it's, you can see it's very much got that kind of idea in it, that sort of emphasis in it already. So in 1922, the fascist party comes to power and there's this national desire to recover imperial status and a culture, a classical culture that will go with it. And um, Muzio and Cironi, it, Cironi together get the uh, commission for the Palazzo del Popolo d'Italia. Popolo d'Italia was the fascist newspaper. Um, and we can see this is a, if you look at it, it looks terribly to me like a rationalist building, but this is coming out of Novicento. And Novicento and the rationalists are going to be in tension with each other, but actually there's a heck of a lot that's very parallel with what's going on with the two of them, which is another reason why I think Novicento architecture is well worth looking at for people into modern movement. And you can see here, there's this big bar relief um, in the front above the entrance, and that is by Cironi. Um, this building after the war, of course, changed its name and it became the Palazzo dei Giornalisti, Giornali, uh, the newspaper building and now the information building. And on the top floor, Inside the top floor is a large room where an entire wall is devoted to this mosaic mural by Cironi, um, fascist work. So um, <clears throat> now rationalism proper takes off in 1926 when the group of seven architectural students get together. Um, and this is a, a moving group. People get replaced quite quickly by others. 
um, and uh, some people move quite a way away. Um, and uh, even Libera really goes down to Rome quite quickly too. So the, the ones that we have who are going to be of interest to us in Milan are really Tarani, so he's going to um, go, going to die in the Second World War. And then this couple of uh, founding students of the movement, Fugini and Pellini, who will found a practice together and will be, I think, particularly interesting for us because in the post-war period, it's them who are carrying forward the flame from the earlier period. And these students um, feel that Novicento's classicism is too individualistic um, and its in type of very expressiveness is inappropriate for modern northern Italy, um, which should be expressing modernism, it, modernity in a more functionalist way, um, but in a way that distances itself from futurism. So they launch a manifesto, but which it gets published in four parts, in four notes within the Rosenia magazine. Um, but in 1926 to 1927. And the four main points here are it distances itself from futurism by emphasizing that it is going to go for the orthogonal rather than for fractured. And that its, its appeal to the machine age is going to be in terms of um, structural logic rather than in terms of dynamism. And then it, it takes its name, it's going to get its name from this rationalist emphasis, rationalism in the sense of a synthesis of two logical ordering systems, one derived from the machine age and the other from classicism, in other words, from Italian heritage. So it's going to fit in with fascism quite well to a certain extent. And then it's going to distance itself from Novicento in saying that classicism should not be used in terms of applying classicist motifs, but rather in recovering or reinterpreting principles, internal logic, ordering systems, proportions. And um, it's seeing modernism as a radical reinterpretation of classicism. And then implicitly, but this is going to come through progressively, it does see itself within this Italian context, it's already hinted at, um, as a nationalist movement rather than an internationalist one. And that is going to be one of the reasons why there's tension between it and Siam. It's drawing on its own national heritage of classicism and it's emphasizing a kind of superiority of Italy in terms of having this classical um, background to it. Um, and it's going to fit fascist policies, um, especially when working uh, and, but I think it's a movement that has a lot to teach contemporary designers today because it's um, very much a, a movement that works because it's working in, uh, above all in Milan, but also in Torino and a bit in Genoa. Um, it's very much working within urban, dense urban contexts. And our walks that we're going to be taking on, on this tour will be, we'll learn from looking at how rationalist buildings integrate into existing uh, streetscapes, how they graft onto them, and how they can, how it's a movement that enables a variety of architects to work together within this one framework, side by side, but in a way that, that enables them to fit together in a cohesive way, yet which adds interest to a streetscape. Um, and to give you an idea of, um, yes, yeah, someone might say this, in a way, it's almost perhaps a type of critical regionalism. And here we can see um, one of the buildings that is quite typical of that interwar period. The, the Monza tri Triennale uh, became the Milan Triennale um, from after 1930, 1930 the last of the Monza Triennale, uh, where you had a whole series of temporary pavilions put forward by various um, contemporary architects. And here is one by Virginia Pellini. There was often a competition for the Casa Electrica. Uh, in of the electric house. Um, I should have mentioned actually, um, Milan was the first city apart from New York to go all electric. It had the second main um, electric supply. It had a uh, very early um, tram, electric <coughs> tram system and it had um, various, uh, it had electric street lighting before anywhere else other than New York. Um, 
So you can see here that it's it's a functionalist building, but already, and we're going to see, um, um, it's particularly evident with Tarani, but not just Tarani, there's a greater influence from um, Russian constructivism than from German functionalism. There's a lot of spatiality and opening up of spaces um, in a very plastic kind of way um, with these buildings. Um, and the rationalists are very international in their outlook. They visit lots of exhibitions abroad. Um, they go to Weissenhof. Um, they, uh, and then in 1928, the magazine La Casabella, which is going to become Casabella later, is launched in Milan. And it's very much pushing not just architecture as design, but a moral imperative for architecture and design to change society. Um, Italy is represented at CM from the very first CM at La Ceres by rationalists, um, by people from that movement rather than anything else. Um, and uh, in 1930, uh, Pagano um, arrives from Torino to Milan. He's an architect and he takes over Casabella and turns it into an instrument for, for of propaganda almost for the rationalists. Um, and uh, goes very much towards um, pushing for standardization for a type of anonymous architecture um, that's uh, going to be, there's going to be a bit of tension there between Milan, Casabella, and Como, Tirani, and Co. Um, the, it, things come to a bit of a crunch point in 1931 when, and this is really um, the, in 1928, the, the name rationalist comes together when Libera um, uh, sets out, uh, in, in 1928, Libera down in Rome, um, sets out an exhibition and they, because it's between Rome and Milan, they give themselves a name, they call themselves uh, Movimento Italiano Ita Architettura Razionale, the movement for um, it, uh, rational Italian architecture. And in um, 1931, there's a second MIAR uh, exhibition in Rome, opened by Mussolini, including by now Tirani and Lingeri's um, Nova Comum. In the first MIAR um, exhibition back in 28, there was no built um, rationalist building available. And in fact, the one building that they built building that they show as an example of what rationalist building might be is the Fiat factory in Lingotto. Um, so uh, the, they have the exhibition in 1930 in Rome, opened by Mussolini and uh, accompanied by a very provocative rationalist text um, which, cri which criticizes the relationship between uh, Mussolini and his source of classicizing architect architecture as being bourgeois and retrograde um, and suggests that uh, rationalism would better serve fascism than would this sort of Nova, um, Novacento kind of architecture. And um, this leads to uh, Mussolini withdrawing funding from the rationalists and to quite a lot of people, the majority of people leaving the rationalists and setting up a new group, which is somewhere in between the rationalists and um, Novocento, which is called Stile Littorio, the Lictorian style. It's a kind of strict classicism, um, modernist, but very monumental. And that is going to become the national style. And uh, for instance, in this Palazzo di Giustizia, the main law courts in Milan by uh, Mussolini's favorite architect, Marcello Piacentini. Um, so this leads to the collapse in as early as 31, 32 of the rationalist movement as a single movement. And from then on, it's going to be a series of independent architects following rationalist ideas and presenting themselves as being rationalist architects, but there's not really a single movement. And if there's anywhere where a movement still exists, it's going to be Milan. Um, and 
but even there, really, it's isolated individuals. Pagano, Fugini and Pellini, Gio Ponti, who had been with Novacento, has come over to um, the rationalist Franco Albini, Sartoris, who goes back and forth between Milan and Ticino, uh, Gal Ignazio Gardella, BBPR, and then in Como, Tirani, Lingeri, Cataneo. So the through 1932 to 1936, the rationalists go on trying to be accepted as the official fascist style of architecture. Um, and they wage this battle through exhibitions, through competition entries, through publications, and using more the Italian newspapers than designer, design magazines to do this. So we get a background there, which is going to go on and be very important of Italian architects and designers speaking to the wider public as a general thing, rather than speaking just to their peers. And I think that's an important thing to bear in mind right the way through. Um, and, but the, at the same time, the, and so that they have a very much wider audience than international modernism does in other countries. Um, and at the same time, the other side of that is because they're using their, their national Italian newspapers rather than international architectural magazines, what they're doing tends to be less well known abroad. The ideas in particular tend to be less well known abroad. Um, and so because it's, it's um, mainly happening through um, individual architects and, and let, the rationalists are getting less of these major public commissions, we see them building in, in Milan, it's a case of building um, more private houses and uh, blocks of, of private flats. So we get, this is a building we'll evidently see from the outside, um, Tarani and Ningeri's Casa Rustici, which is quite extraordinary, the, a way in which the degree to which it's opened up, um, so you can see right the way through it, through its internal courtyards, etc. Um, and then similarly, we also get um, Fugini and Pellini building this house for Fugini, which is really more Corbusier than Corbusier, this house on stilts. Um, at the time built really on the outskirts of Milan. If you go to see it today, it's quite extraordinary. You cannot get this view anymore because it's now a street. The, the, what you see on the right-hand side here, this lit short face is onto the street beside that big tree. And the long sides of it are within a, a street that's full of much more conventional houses up against it, both sides. Um, so 1930, um, yes, um, 1930, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Italian rationalism also at this period is very much the development of it is, is going to be very much influenced by um, looking at regional vernacular. There's a very strong belief amongst the Italian rationalists that vernacular architecture is architecture which has developed in um, response to local climate and local conditions, and therefore it's uh, the architecture that's most appropriate to, to the place. And wherever they, and so they start doing a lot of research into vernacular architecture, particularly rural vernacular architecture, because they believe that that is where the, the local tradition has remained most. And they start looking at and deriving from it various ideas, such as these, these great overhangs with uh, arcades or, or more, more commonly um, of, of, pilas, uh, of pillars, um, which, you, which then give you summer shading. This is a, a continental climate. So Milan and Torino are very, very hot in summer, um, more so than various places further south. Um, and you get, you may sort of already be thinking Galeratesi and things like that. Um, and then over here, they're very interested in these um, uh, vernacular means of allowing ventilation into buildings without allowing um, very much direct sunlight in. And um, so also using local materials 
of um, being very interested in um, using brick, which is the main building material of Milan. Um, and so the buildings are going to not be white um, modern movement, they're going to be more pink and other colors as well. Now in 1935, Italy's dream of empire results in the invasion of Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, which gets condemned by all the rest of the world apart from Hitler. And this leads to international isolation. So there's uh, the fascist introduced a policy called economic independence, which means you can't import anything much. And this applies also to building materials. So there's next to no steel. So um, concrete can only be very little reinforced and um, no reinforced, there's a law passed, no reinforced concrete is allowed above five stories. And this leads to solid masonry structures, particularly in brick, but sometimes even in stone. Um, and we can see the results of, of this already because of this interest in vernacular. We have people moving this way and we see here an example, Ignazio Gardella, a TB clinic in Alessandria, where you're using this waffle brick work in front of a gallery, in front of the main wall, so as to mediate the sun. Um, and then these other lesser forms um, uh, at lower level. And then here, Asnago and Vender, um, to doing, uh, reusing the forms that they have observed in vernacular architecture in their building of uh, peasant housing, um, not very far from Milan at all. And this idea of colonnade and gallery, so as to give you shading, but natural ventilation. Um, and uh, with this move um, post 1935, we have masonry structures, but also in order to lighten the loads and higher stories, so as to enable you to go higher rise, a lost use of hollow bricks, of cork, of conglomerate panels made of impregnated wood or vegetable fibers, of using, of putting pumice into concrete to make it more lightweight. But these same constraints are imposed on everyone. So the Novicenta people, um, the um, li, uh, Stilo Littorio people are going to be having to do the same sorts of things. So although the rationalists are presenting themselves as sort of the most pure form of modern movement, there's a heck of a lot of crossover and a lot of um, very similar things going on. Um, and 1936 is really a turning point. And 1936, we see um, the sixth triennale at Milan um, called Continuity Modernity, um, presents in a, uh, an exhibition put together by Pagani and another Guarnieri, Danielle, um, but mainly by Pagano. They present here the results of their research into um, vernacular, into rural vernacular across Italy. It's a big research project. For, it's presented in form of, of um, photographs, masses of photographs, which then make a book that's published under the aegis of Casabella. Um, and the, um, it, it's of um, a whole series of photos of, of rural architecture. And the catalogue begins with a, a preface that ends, we hope that this work of ours makes the aesthetic significance of the rural house understood. Knowledge of the laws of its functionalism and artistic respect for our impressive but little known heritage of healthy and honest rural architecture could save us from academicist relapses, will immunize us against bombastic rhetoric, they're getting at the Mussolini type fascist architecture, could say and above all, give us pride in knowing the true indigenous tradition of Italian architecture. It's in this vernacular rather than in classism, clear, logical, linear, morally, and even formally, very close to contemporary taste. So this is the sort of thing that they're publishing. And you can see here, again, a lot of these colonnaded and galleried buildings, often with sort of um, a certain amount of almost proto breeze soleil in timber. And then at the same time, Pagano himself is building 
um, Bocconi University, which is one of the universities, the best um, reputations for, for uh, as patron with going through to Grafton and Sanar recently. And you can see, and with Gardella and um, Muzio in between, but you can see here very clearly how he is making a very modern building, but taking principles from, from the local vernacular in order to do it. And then his, his own furniture and furnishings for um, an auditorium inside, where it's all made from local materials, including a lot of these Italian produced composite materials um, or made from timber and that. Um, and at the same time, there's a kind of architecture of resistance promoted by Adriana um, Olivetti at Ivrea, um, where he is commissioning above all in the late 30s and through the war years, Fugini and Pellini. And here at the top, you see the, um, the administrative center from 34 to 36. And if I hadn't told you about the galleries and the and this sort of thing, if we hadn't already seen some other rationalist buildings, I just think this is a modernist building, but you can see the way in which there's this rigor and there's this, um, this division that's almost in a way a bit um, reiterated, a bit um, uh, echoing what we see with Tirani. And, and then down here at the bottom left-hand corner, we have that kindergarten, um, of 1939 to 40, and notice that here we have solid stone walls with a concrete structure here. And then we have two sets of workers' housing in the Borgo Olivetti, in other words, the, the village that's set up for workers. And here again, we have um, quite low rise uh, concrete structures, um, pink to um, refer to the local tradition. Well, World War II hits central Milan very badly as a very extensive Allied bombing um, because of its commercial and industrial role. And so there's an, a very great need for reconstruction. And the architects available from rationalism, well, um, Tirani and Cataneo are both dead and Como really is almost frozen in history at that point. Most of the leading rationalists have joined the resistance. Pagano and Banffi, the first B in BPPR are both killed in concentration camp. And several of the leading architects from rationalism, uh, from, from um, not from rationalism so much, but more from um, the architects in general, have been contaminated by their fascist association, and Lingeri and uh, sort of Moretti in particular. Um, so in within Milan, this puts Fugini and Pellini into a leading position. It puts BBPR, without the first B, um, into a leading position, not least because they were entirely Jewish firm, um, and B, um, Beltragioso, and P, Perizzuti have both been in the resistance as well. R, Ernesto Rogers, had spent most of the war in Switzerland. Um, and so, as Nargo and Vendor are okay, Gardella's okay, but otherwise it's going to be largely passed into a younger generation. And um, Milan becomes very much a center for, uh, for the reconstruction of Italy. It, money goes in that direction because you want to rebuild commerce and industry so as to relaunch the country. So finance becomes available and it's the place where reconstruction takes off. And so the rationalists allied with a, a rather left of center um, uh, local government um, put forward plans for reconstruction, and Milan becomes, as a result, the center for architectural debate um, with a couple of, of movements in there, um, and led probably above all by Ernesto Rogers, the R in BBPR, who by now is editor of Domus. Um, and he's pushing the idea through Domus that um, we should be looking at culture, not just architecture, and seeing that as as a means for rebuilding society, not just um, uh, um, buildings on their own. And um, it's very much appealing towards um, a general public, not just architects and designers. And from 1954, he'll be taking over Casabella instead. 
So it's not really surprising, I think, that CM7 meets at Bergamo because um, everything's happening really in northern Italy and around here, and that's where things are taking off. Um, the Italian government uh, pushes for city plans to be developed for three cities that are all in the north, Milan, Torino and Genoa. Um, and even when Olivetti is sponsoring journals, one of those is called Urbanistica. Um, so high profile office buildings in the um, central business district are very important, just near the central station. So since the central station have been and the railway lines have been um, one of the uh, foci for bombing raids, you had virtually a tabula rasa situation there. Um, and uh, so Milan positions itself now as an international business center, trying to say, you know, alongside London, New York, etc. here we are. And so these are very important symbols, these new big um, high rise office blocks. Um, and at the same time, in Italy, something we don't realize perhaps so much, but implicitly it's saying, and we have now got access to steel again, because otherwise you couldn't be building this high. So it's very much um, a celebration of the post-fascist new Italy. And the most famous of these, of course, is the Torre Pirelli by Ponti and Nervi. Um, but the, I would argue that the Torre Galfa is at least as interesting structurally, where, you know, we get completely glazed skin just floating over the whole thing, uh, particularly at the corners. I think it's very nice. Um, the Pirelli is 32 stories. Galfa, which precedes it slightly, 28 stories. Um, and then also nearby, um, there's Breda or Spitzero, um, which is um, 1955, it's one of the and 30 stories. Um, uh, only the first eight stories are offices, and then above that is ha housing. It was the highest till Pirelli came along. Um, apart from these three and Torre Velasca, nothing as high as this gets built in Milan for over 50 years. So this really, these four um, high-rise buildings, and you can see um, Torre Velasquez sitting, standing behind Philip there, um, it's very important, um, this building of these icons. Um, the eighth tri Milan Triennale in 1947 takes its theme, National Reconstruction. And the director is Piero Bottoni, um, and he replaces the usual exhibition of temporary pavilions in Sempioni Park, which were models of, of modern bourgeois upper class homes, with a permanent exemplar for working class living. QT8, Cartieri Triennale Otto, um, the, the district set up for the 8th Triennale. And it's a district then on the then edge of the city, and it's the first realization of the Athens Charter. You can see here it has a big green park and it has a series of very different types of buildings and different forms of buildings scattered over it in this kind of garden city-ish kind of layout. And it, uh, it's the first realization of the Athens Charter in that it separates out traffic. It brings in zones for um, education, for, for residents, for um, co commercial shops, um, etc. It has a church, it has all its facilities there. And it even has in the middle of that big park, a big hill created from the bomb rubble um, taken in from the rest from central Milan. And the idea is to bring upper class, intellectual class dwelling to the working classes. And it's conceived as an experiment with specialized with specialized sub districts for various different types of, of building. So you get a range of different um, le uh, heights of building, of terraces, of masonettes, of flats, of uh, um, all sorts of different things. Um, and using some whole districts, for instance, a district of masonettes or a district of low rise flats 
um, for a particular um, person, in one case for war veterans, and then di six different models by six different architects built together. And the idea being, this is an experiment, we'll see how we'll do sociological and technical surveys year by year afterwards to see how these work. Um, it's very much um, linked, therefore, with this uh, academic research. Uh, but it's, it's modern, but it tends to be rather low tech. Um, and this in part is because you've got plenty of labor coming in from Southern Italy and you don't want unemployment. So it's a deliberate policy of not of standardization, but not mechanization. We want to use as many workers as possible. Um, and one photograph that's just really too grainy for me to use here has a wonderful caption of modern building site and all the building materials have been brought by horse and cart. Um, one of the, out, out of this comes a, a policy um, from the National Insurance Institute, ENA, um, which is a series of housing estates which are built to house this massive influx from the South of uh, working class people, uh, unskilled labor, who are going to help with the rebuilding of Milan um, and with industry too, taking off in the factories. Um, there are big bidonvilles, big um, shanty towns built uh, around um, Milan. And so, so then there is a series of um, Inakaza estates, which follow this policy in the first stage, 19, um, up to about 19, 56, I think, um, of relative, generally more low rise, a mix of, of types, but with quite a lot of low rise apartment blocks and terrace houses, an almost garden village setting. And still, we've got this idea of reinforced concrete post and beam structures, brick infill, rendering some facades. It's a very colorful form and a textured form of um, modernism. And it's also uh, got a lot of these deep lodges, um, deep balconies. And so here we see one which we will visit probably at the same time as we visit QT8. It's not very far away from it. Um, and uh, oh, oh, oops, sorry, I'm skating through these now because they're rather similar but to give you an idea. Um, so this is one um, mainly by Virginia and Pellini. And this is another one just to show you that this is very much, it's, it could be um, British post-war estates, couldn't it to a certain extent, but it's rather more colorful, um, often with a lot of ceramic tiling being used to, this one's by BPPR. Um, and uh, then when they, when they do get in, in, in a city site, this one will definitely see, uh, this is almost beside the um, Tirani and Lingeri uh, um, building that we saw before, the, um, that one, um, but obviously very high rise because by now city center sites are very expensive and this is social housing, not private. Um, and then in, we also get, um, as the land values rise, we get either mixed use coming in so here we have shops, offices, and then housing above in central Milan. Um, this is in the second phase of, of Ina Kazitz's 56 to 64. And then we have, um, and this has got Gio Ponti and others. And then here we have one by Muzio um, and we have uh, an internal garden. Um, and we have again, this, this pink brick, but then also, um, uh, white aluminium lodgers and timber window frames. So very articulated. Um, and at the same time, we have slightly better housing being built for civil service servants um, in KISS. And this tends to be in slightly more park-like um, settings, slightly better flats with big lodgers. This is one example by Franco Albini. And then also, private sector um, coming on. And this, I think, is a very nice example by Virginia Pellini, which we'll see at least from the outside, um, how it slots into the existing city-state um, 
uh, streetscape whilst being absolutely modern. And you can see here from the section that this is actually what we're seeing on the street, um, a, a, a block which is no higher than the others, but then after an internal garden, we have a higher block behind the rear block. Um, and we see here, for instance, another of these examples of post-war reconstruction, Caccia Dominioni, um, rebuilding his own family's palazzo um, on the site opposite Sant'Ambrogio, the Basilica Sant'Ambrogio, and then bang next door to it as Nago and Venda, commissioned by another family who lost their palazzo, um, but who wants to have a block of flats in which they'll just have a luxury flat instead of a whole block. And um, these are side by side, very different, but compatible. Um, also, we get BBPR, who one sort of tends to think of as sort of Tari Velasco, sort of rather, you know, um, bombastic. But they do a lot of very interesting it, um, work where they're, they're knitting in. This is one, one development which knits in right the way through into some, some garden settings, um, really rather nicely knitted in. Um, standalone blocks are very rare. Uh, there are a couple by Gardella, both on parks. I'm not quite sure how Gardella alone got two park side um, commissions, but he did. So he has a couple of really nice upmarket ones. And then also when it's, um, th these were, um, Moretti got three commissions from the same developers who were wanting to build for really um, bed sits. Um, and he gets, the, these therefore have to be very much cheaper, they're smaller units and they're much more high rise. And this is now completely in the middle of century, you know, other stuff has been built around it. This is after you've got bombing, leaving the site um, free. Um, so then rationalism in, in there, this is what everyone always remembers BBPR for, Torrey Velasca. Rationalism in Northern Italy, 1950s onwards. Well, 54, Ernesto Rogers takes over the editorship of Casabella, and we see there the continuation of this Northern Italian um, tradition of linking theory and criticism with practice and um, looking at how environment links modern architecture with historical tradition because of this drawing on vernacular. Um, and very much seeing architecture, townscape, rather than individual buildings. In a way, this, this is the one building that goes against it all. Um, but very much um, looking to local tradition, local construction practices, trying to fit into a, a pre-existing environment, and also fitting with the tradition that's been set by Italian modernism, that's distinct from other modernism, in other words, rationalism. And um, the um, and there's very much also a sense because of this reconstruction of building for a mass audience rather than from a small avant-garde one. So um, looking towards governmental, state, municipal patrons, and knowing that you're building for the working classes, wanting to do something which is a bit popularist, working with context, context but also doing something which um, creates. Uh, identifiable buildings that people can recognize and treat as landmarks. And that's really what's going on here, where this echoes one of the towers coming out of the Renaissance Schwarzer um, fortress. Um, so there's also a lot of sociological research being pushed in Milan and around, looking at the relationship between social structure, popular culture, and architecture, architecture can be developed from it. So we get a lot of work on neighborhoods and the creation of neighborhoods um, rather than individual buildings. Uh, Gardella's Borsellino housing at Alessandria, Giancarlo Di Carlo's research and um, his Matra housing. Um, we get a lot of, of work looking again at na national tradition, uh, popular culture um, in terms of structure and construction in terms of the artisan craft nature of Italian architecture. Again, as I said before, against mechanization because you can keep unemployment down if you use plenty of labor instead of 
um, uh, mechanization. So the necessary rationalization of construction needed for mass housing programs and the related facilities uh, um, is going to be um, on the one hand, very much artisan uh, standardization in design, but artisan construction. And it's also going to be um, trying to make something which can be recognizable, given identity. And these things come together in a, a great emphasis on expressing elements, particularly structural components, which, well, Tori Velasco is very good for that. Um, and um, so that's the first issue of the 1950s, what's going on from inside. But late 1950s, there's the big crunch, the split from international modernism. And 1959, this starts in April with Raina Bannum's famous article in AR, Neo-Liberty, the Italian retreat from modern architecture. And he's very critical about um, Italian modernism, particularly Milanese modernism, particularly the rationalists. And he's very pro the Roman type of modernist. He's great pal with Bruno Zavi. And he particularly wants to stick the knife into Ernesto Rogers and Casabella. He criticizes Rogers for promoting historicist eclecticism. And he also goes against um, Aldo Rossi, who, by the way, is Ernesto Rogers's editorial assistant at this point, newly graduated from School of Architecture, where he was trained at Milan Polytechnic by a lot of these rationalist architects. And uh, um, Bannum says that what's going on there calls the whole status of the modern movement in Italy into question. He criticizes North Italian modernism as merely a style. He criticizes Tirani's Casa del, del Fascio at Como as hollow formalism. Um, he criticizes Olivetti's patronage as producing stylistic determinism and says he got away with it because he had such good, such excellent PR. Um, he sees post-war Italian modernism as relying on a mood of social responsibility, of conscious avant-gardism. Um, I think both of these show he's just totally misunderstood what's going on there from the inside out. And he accused it of, of taking too much of the foreign aid that's come for Italian reconstruction. And this should all have gone to Rome instead and Bruno Zavi and the organicist streak and all of that. He thinks that the problem is also one of patronage, um, that it's either governmental or bourgeois. It's therefore not out and out modernism. He criticizes Ina Kaza, it's, it's this lukewarm stuff, blah, blah, blah. and he calls Rossi and his sort of thing, the style of the retreat from modernism. So he gets this name, Neo-Liberty. Um, it's been coined the year before by Paul, Paolo Portoghese in Rome. Um, and uh, it, he's seeing it as reviving the ethos of the style of industrial wealth, of the bourgeoisie of 1900. He criticizes Virginia and Pellini's schemes, particularly that one that we've just seen on Via Barletto, where it's nicely integrated into the street front. He criticizes BBPR and particularly that exhibition for um, pavilions and things. Um, and he, this then continues through in September 1959 into CM10, the Sotelo, where there's a debate in which, um, which, which comes out of the fact that everyone's been presenting their latest buildings. Ernesto Rogers has presented Torrey Velasca, which has just been completed the year before, and Peter Smithson absolutely slaughters it. He criticizes it for formalism and historical revivalism. But nota bene, the Italians have brought realized projects. They've brought BBPR, have brought Torrey Velasca, Giancarlo De Carlo's brought his matter of housing, Gardello's brought his, Olivetti, his canteen for Olivetti at Ivrea. Um, what have the British brought? Well, the Smithsons and dear old Christopher Dean, our ex-chair, ex and Brian Richards have brought projects, not built. The only built project that the Brits can build, bring is John Volker's little house in Arkley in Hertfordshire. Now, if that's not bourgeois, um, I'd like to know what is. You know, so Rogers comes, hits back, and Rogers says, look, I'm justified in what I do. There are social factors involved in what we're doing that you've totally misunderstood or glossed over. There's the clarity of structure in what we're doing. 
And there's an awareness, dig, dig, dig at the Brits. There's an awareness of what we're doing. There's the multiplicity of factors involved in actually getting a building built. So this there's an irreconcilable, in, irreconcilable divide at this point um, due to a different understanding of the nature and role of history in modern architecture. And this is going to continue so that through the 50s and the 60s and the, to a certain extent the 70s, Italian modernism develops apart from the rest of Europe. And then when we get to, uh, and it, when I say Italian, it's really, I'm talking about Northern Italian, including Ticino, because the overlap and the to and fro between what's going on in Northern Italy and what's going on in Italian speaking Switzerland, so close to it, is, is there the whole time. Um, so they are going to be criticizing pure functionalism and they're going to be very much emphasizing the need to develop typologies, recognizable building types that, that working class people can identify um, and so which can get lodged in the collective memory. And uh, obviously Rossi is going to be the leading character there. He's going to teach at ETH in Switzerland. So this is going to take the Italian modernist rationalist series of ideas over to Zurich, interestingly, um, and the buildings that they're building in the best known ones in uh, Milan, which we will see, um, of course, are the famous Galeratesi ones. And now you see what I mean about these arcades and the galleries and the lodges, you know, it's going back to the vernac local vernacular. And so when we get to the 80s in Britain and we start getting this criticism of um, the, the, the uh, function, uh, functionalist modern movement, at that point, Italian rationalism comes into view and comes, it gets really looked at seriously and positively. And Italian, also Ticino, Mario Botta, Luigi Snozzi, Aurelio Galfetti, Livio Bacchini. And just to give you a last image, um, here we are, Aldo Rossi, um, one of his very last um, buildings. It's a little fabric, if you like, a monument in the middle of the city um, to Sandro Pettini, a long time, uh, an ex um, president of Italy, uh, a resistant and a um, socialist. There we are. I hope that's given the context, a rather more social and political and type of context which are on you. Now, Tom, how do we get rid of me and pass over to you? Um, it should now be, Philip should now be. What should I be doing? You should share screen. Do I? Share screen. Yes, Ginny, there we go. Fine. Thank you, Judy. Well, Philip's um, uh, fiddling with his fiddling with his PowerPoint. <laughs> um, shall we go? Right. Right. Oh, thank you, thank you, Judy, for a, a marvelous um, overview. Very dense, and 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 um, I, I kept thinking what Doctor Momo is about. It's having historians and architects get to grips with each other. Uh, so um, uh, <laughs> with things, um, and and quite often on our tours, they 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 go on quite late into the day. Uh, I'm afraid I'm I'm going to talk for a little bit now, and I hope you I hope your windows are open and you're feeling cool. But um, I was going to talk about one architect and four buildings. Um, uh, and basically, uh, Tirani himself, uh, two pictures of him here. One is aboard the SS Patras for CM3 in 1933. And the upper photo in 1942 with him returning as an artillery officer uh, from the Russian front. Um, a little bit about him now. Um, uh, his he died shortly afterwards in 1943, after that, that, that a photo was, was, was taken um, at the age of 39. So his career was fairly short, but uh, uh, born in 1904, um, outside of Milan, his father was a builder who owned his own construction business. 
and his mother was extremely involved in him training in, in the arts. Um, it, it was really a, a family background, a bit like not not quite like Frank Lloyd Wright's, but 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 where where things could could happen. I mean, his brother Attila was a structural engineer, so um, he uh, uh, Giuseppe uh, enrolled in 1917, qualified in 1921, uh, met Piero Linguiri, who several of these names Judy's told you about. So, but Piero Linguiri, was, he was in partnership with him all the way through uh, his, his, his career. So there was a, a sort of support mechanism there and a context in which he worked, which was quite um, encouraging. Um, uh, he joined this group, which again, Judy has told you about the, the, the seven of the, the younger people who published their, 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 their uh, um, magazine. Uh, 33, he took part uh, uh, in CM3, the famous, famous one with the boat. Um, and I'm going to move on now. Um, on the right here, Milan, to the top of this picture of the North Como, where the, the, most of the, built, the three of the four buildings I'm going to show you are, are, are located. The fourth one, which is a house, is halfway between Como uh, and Milan at Servizo. And on the left, you can see uh, a, a bigger plan showing the old part, old city of, of Como, which in a valley at the end of the lake, uh, and, and most of the building we're going to see are, are within that um, context. Novecento, I'm not going to say any more about that because uh, I think this slide has been covered perfectly well by, by Judy. Um, uh, and the, 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 these, these are the, uh, four, well, there are more than four buildings there, but basically these four buildings. Um, I'm going to start, not in the middle, but, but with the CM conference in 33, because this was quite, um, as, as many of you will know, um, this Congress, the, th the fourth one, uh, was supposed to be in Moscow, which couldn't happen in 1933. Um, so uh, Christian Vizervas, the, the Greek, said he could hire this boat. They would have a conference. Um, going by boat to Athens, have some meetings there, um, be shown a bit of Greece, and then sail back in the boat. And on, on, on the boat, they could have the conference and do it properly. Uh, and without going on at great length about this, you can see that the, 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 the attendants, if you like, participants at this conference were mainly from France and, and, and Switzerland. Um, it, was, um, it was recorded in different ways. One of the most interesting ways it was recorded was by Molly Narge, who came there under the at that time under the German auspices, we made a short film on it, which we've got, we've got hold of. Um, uh, and there's also recently been a book written by two English people um, about um, part of this conference, which was the boat, the, the second boat trip out of Paris and back, um, which I'll show you a bit of. Um, um, these are, uh, at that time, these are photos brought back by Terranyi on the right, maybe obscured by your own pictures, but the one I showed you of him, uh, uh, and uh, here's a very grainy picture of them on the boat going out, um, being spoken to, the crowd of them. This is Bottoni, one of the group of seven, uh, doing his expose, uh, his, expose his discussion commentary on Verona. It's Verona down here, um, done on, on, on the way out. Uh, th there were a number of cities that were gone, gone through. Here on the left, you can see, uh, I think behind it's Amsterdam, uh, and Botoni is still there with his beret, and Corbusier, who, while everybody did their, <laughs> their presentations, he tended to come in and take over, and they were rather delayed, and, and a bit off course by his, 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 his embracing of the radieurs, which he, he propagated quite loudly. Uh, but anyway, uh, there were a number of these things. They didn't get through them all on the way out, and some of them were done on the way back. The photo on the right is on this boat trip, uh, which was on a smaller English boat and rather rough. And there were two storms on the channel when they went to the islands. And this is a picture of Corbusier wrapped up in whatever clothing he can find. And you can see the back of the head of Leger with his and strings of clothes. The boat had been very struck by, by a storm. Um, and a man in the middle is a member of the crew, and you can see his hair isn't recovered from the storm. Um, uh, that's the islands they went to. And, 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 and this part of the conference, which is of course not recorded by the, the, the official documents, um, had some outcomes, which we want to try and do an event on here in Dokomoma, if we can trace the research properly. Um, here, when, when uh, it was uh, Terranyi who presented uh, the Italian project for Como. There were several Italian, as you saw the number of them there. And these are the boards they presented. So under the, under the, 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 the 
the rules of, 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 of CIM grids and things we've done in terms of traffic, recreation, decentralization, urban details and regional planning. And there you can see the center of, of, of Como and some of the expansion on it. Uh, the illustration says that the project would, would have been demonstrated and talked about in this way uh, going, going out. Um, just that's, this is the third board they had. You can, this, this, this does actually show Como at the end of the lakes with Ticino, the Swiss part just up here, how it, how it links in both topographically and, and culturally, which is something that, that, that Judy mentioned. When they came back um, from the conference, the, the, the Como group went on and did their work. And this is a, a beautiful drawing of, 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 of that was drawn up afterwards where they, 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 they applied the principles of, 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 of study um, that Corbett and Eston had laid down then to, um, to Como. Uh, and, and part of that was to look at the historic center and actually looking at the historic center to look at, look at how new and old buildings fitted together. You can see from these drawings here that, that the actual old uh, city is, 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 is on a grid and within the grid you get you get um, parts you can do and here's some of the sort of studies that they did this the, they so the 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 conference from, from their point of view I don't think anybody in Britain did anything quite as thorough as this uh, but they, they they did studies for various buildings in in Como and they went on and this is drawings of of a, a market a competition for market, uh, which Tony did he didn't win the competition but but it showed how they were taking on board what, what was being done by Siam at, at that time. So I'll, I'll leave that there for you to remember it. Um, this is one of the earliest uh, edifices that um, uh, uh, Tirani got up in, in, in Como. It's a war memorial uh, and, and it's very resembles uh, St. Elias, one of St. Elias drawings and him being a young architect, it, it was criticized when it was put in the competition, you know, just copying this thing, um, which was earlier on. But as time went on, it, its differences and its, uh, and its character were recognized and it, and it did get built. Um, being young and being a modernist, we won't use the term rationalist yet, um, most of the things that he did in this period came under criticism. People. But this is the first of the four buildings I'm going to talk about, uh, the Nokoman apartment block in 1928. So he got to redesign this at the age of 23. Um, it's a five story block, 63 meters long apartment block. Um, so it's quite a large project for an architect of, of, of that age. Uh, and you can see those of us who know our history know that this corner uh, with the round round parts on these lower floors and the cantilevered rectangular orthogonal bit above uh, is very reminiscent of, of Gazprom's Gossip, I can't pronounce his name properly, but we, we, when we went to Moscow, we saw this building, this workers' club in Moscow was a, exactly the same shape. And Tarani could have been accused of being a young outer copying this, this shape of a, of a building. It, functionally, actually, it's completely different. That, that, that in, in this, the circular element is this magnificent staircase and was glazing, you get a double skin thing there for the conference hall at the side. But the image there clearly, he probably hadn't been there, but he probably seen the drawing. Um, anyway, a, a, as a project, uh, it's located in Coma where the red dot is here, up near the lake, just out of the older part of the city. And there was already on one side of the block, um, there was an existing block, which is this part here. And the new part is put on this side, facing north, Across, across over um, the, the local stadium towards the lake with the mountains beyond. So at upper levels, it had great views, not so great at lower level. Um, in plan, you can see it on, on the block here, it forms a, a court with a building going around half of it. Um, what goes on here is, 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 is uh, I think, is, 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 is very interesting. Um, they are quite large apartments. Uh, and the structure of the building basically is it has an external low bearing wall, but it also has on the lower floors extremely used solid masonry structural walls right across without them BPS. And it's planned around the structure that as you rise up it, these walls become smaller. When you get to the top, they turn just in, in, into columns to support the whole thing. That's not something you see uh, when looking at it or even using it, I don't think these days, but it shows the integration of, 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 of a sophisticated, a mature uh, integration of structure with architectural form. This shows one of the upper floors. Um, we, we can see the round thing with the big apartments on, on the corners and, 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 and the really generous staircases that, that lead to them on, sorry, on the corners. Uh, and the one in the middle, the entrance is under the middle here. And I'll, I'll go on quite fast, I think, with a lot of drawings here. Right, three levels here. So the ground level, you can cut, 
you come in in, in in the middle and the staircase is there to the wing, two wings to go to the back and you can go along to the other ones at either end so the axis is all the way through and you can see here again when i was saying about the walls down the middle slight smaller walls above and, and the columns on 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 on, on the top um, it's five stories high so different things happen on each level you get these lovely spacious flats on the top with the curves um, and um, uh, going down it you get the the, the larger larger apartments um, when it was got planning permission from uh, uh, it was a neoclassical block he changed it to this modern thing again there was severe criticism oi this young bloke has changed this it's not what was given planning permission and it's gone up here as this 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 this, this modern nationalist Functional building, um, uh, 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 and that, that that caused a stir. But I, I don't know how whether his family connection or, how, or the way that things work in Italy means that, that, that this that this extraordinary building by a young architect got designed and got built. Um, you can see here again that the different levels have balconies that come out in a different way, and, and and the lightness of the structures and the large size of the windows that are also structurally within the walls as you go up, quite. Uh, unlikely for um, uh, a building of this sort. Here, these are more, more recent photos. These are photos by, a, a, not me, photographer called Paolo Rosselli. Um, and they can show the color, particularly animating the corners in this plate. And here you can see it in relation to the building behind it. Uh, and here you can see, again, why different things happen on the different levels. There's the stadium in front and the mountains beyond. So the lower two floors have rather restricted views, but where you get the magnificent views, you get the more magnificent architecture. Going on through the, the, the use of color with the shapes here, um, the entrance, the church going together, um, same view again in black and white. Again, the steps, the, 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 the simplicity and the generosity. Uh, it, it's, it's modern throughout these steps, um, through and up large lobbies inside. The use of the color yellow on the soffits of the balconies, um, quite a distilled use of color, actually. Uh, in the flats themselves, uh, our old friends, the metal windows, the views out, the spaces that you get with these circular corners. This is in a flat at this size, you get where, 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 you, where, you've, where you've come in, um, you get quite large rooms. The other thing is that we've started the partitions between the walls, you could alter them. So again, being a large building, it's incredibly flexible inside. Views out, views out. There's the woman where, and you can see the sort of scenery that you see from, from, from the top floor. And, 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 and a beautiful rates. These are fairly recent photos, so it, it, it's in really good condition. Right. Um, uh, and the second building I'm going to do is, is a school, is an infant's school. And this is located, uh, if we have the map of Como here, uh, uh, in, in, in the inner sub, outside of the inner city, where we were before was just up here. Uh, the school, an infant school just outside here, which is um, extremely simple. And, and beautifully relaxed. Um, it again is quite small, five meters high, four, and, yes, between five and five meters. Uh, it is for infant children, 50 children. So it's a small scale infant children. Um, uh, and you can see there the plan, which I'll show you a bit more of in a minute, uh, an axonometric showing it basically with teaching rooms down the side here, courtyard in the middle, and, and classrooms that open out to the outside. Um, uh, the entrance, the entrance is a, a beautiful entrance. This side, we're open, very open entrance um, to the open side, inside. So, especially you see right through. Again, these classrooms have partitions between them that you can move and fold away. So you can combine the volumes of these rooms in any way you want to. Um, uh, this is one of Eisenman's analysis of this from his thesis when he was at Cambridge, um, showing how this building is broken down and made up the access through the middle. Again, going on from that, uh, models. Uh, uh, Terrani had the idea that for toddlers, it was good for them to toddle up ramps, that a ramp would be a walking experience that they really needed. When the building got built, it, the ramp <laughs> got cut probably in the budget, uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't take, take place. Um, here, here's a model of them relating it to the sun, because how the sun and it, they did it in the model, and, and you had these marvelous awnings where which step out from, from the classrooms. Um, if you think of the sort of other schools that were being done at this time, like Neutra's ones in California, they're much simpler and less sophisticated than this in the way they relate to the sun with these awnings that you can adjust and alter according to how bright the sun is and the magnificent location of them all, then opening out. 
um, internally the classrooms with the partitions out so you could open out these big spaces should there be sort of thing that requires that. Um, again, the sort of in-between spaces of older Van Eyck type things, um, the courtyard in the middle, courtyard in the landscape, roof over the courtyard. The roof you could go to up where that railing is, that's where they were supposed to toddle up a ramp, but they have to toddle up the staircase. Um, uh, inside courtyard again, I'll go through these fairly fast. Um, this is the staircase up, more of a detail of that. You can see how beautifully put it, it put together it is. A simple building, but every detail is, as I think other people doing things at this period. Um, I, I, I remember my, I went in, in my, in, I went to a primary school in North London, the older Van Eyck had been as well. He'd been there in the late 30s to 40s. I was there late, late 40s to 50s. And our little classroom, which was done by, I think, by an ex, um, one of Ernest May's architects, was on a much smaller and meaner scale than this. As, 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 as an infant school, it, it, it's remarkably generous and it's still there today doing its stuff. Here it is with them all regimented in their little seats. The scale of the space. Um, on, on one side partitions and I um, don't think we need that one anymore. Um, a view with less, less children in it. This is all this area. Yes, I would like to look at the entrance just a little bit because I do think it's so beautiful. Um, that, that where you enter the doors on this side, there's just a, a, a transparent glazed screen of a of minimal height. Um, so it's, in, in, in scale, it, 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 it introduces you to the bigger scale that's coming on in it. This is in plan, we're looking from this direction here, a glazed screen across there, the entrance up the step here. To the side here is this marvelous thing, which is a sort of sort of balcony uh, in between, at a very small scale in between the inside and the outside. And you can see there that, that, it, that it, it, it provides a zone where, where children are being collected or are leaving, or these ones are waiting, looking out. There's a transitional area, which is directly related to, to small children's um, view of the world. Um, right. I'm doing for time. Right. Okay. Uh, now going on to a house. Um, this house is located halfway between Como and uh, Milan. Um, it's it's a very unusual house. Um, uh, um, uh, I've described it here. It's cubicle. This entry is from the rear middle floor. Yes, the middle floor and the basement are um, raised. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and, and it has a very important roof. It has, it's a, near quite a main road um, on a rectangular side and, re and, and planned orthogonally parallel with the roads. Here, here, here it is, um, you may think it's, you may, you may think of a bit of gosh, but it's not like that at all. This is much more of a distilled composition than it is of one of Corbusier's flowing space ones. The spaces here, um, they do flow, but they flow in the most unorthodox way. And um, what you're looking at here, it's basically a three-story house with a basement. And in the basement, there's a car park. And this round you see here is the ramp round to the car, which is parked under this end of the building here. You enter it from the main entrance from the street is up these steps here, back off center. I've gone on to the plan, doesn't matter, that's okay. Uh, um, I was describing the basement here, you go down, there's a garage underneath. Uh, if you're entering it, you enter it in the middle and there is a, a, a well, when you enter it, unlike Garsh, there's a well-defined entrance area. You can see paved there and a staircase in a fairly conventional position, but in the in, position in, in the rectangle of the total house in quite a, a, a back sort of non-important space. The hall itself goes on and has uh, an almost equal exit to the garden to the rear and, 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 and steps down to it. Uh, you can see this um, this is the rear elevation, that ramp going down. This is the front elevation where you've just entered in. And to right here, this is a quite complex arrangement of rectangular forms uh, on this end of the house and also voids that pierce into it. And the roof itself has this, these slabs, these rectangular slabs, which um, from below are in rather irrational positions that cover the, the, the roof garden at the top. Um, here's a model of them they're studying this house with sunlight from the garden side, where you can see um, the, the, the garden, rather plain elevation to the garden that side, uh, but these roofs here that shade the shape of the roof on the top in relation to the sun, it's being thought through. Uh, top view of that, where you can see the roof terrace, which occupies the whole of the top, uh, of the top roof level, but at one end it drops down and there's a terrace on the level below with a staircase up to it, but the staircase is at one end of the house. And you can see here these positioning of these roof slabs 
interesting. Um, quite complicated set of drawings. I, I, I just use these to illustrate the fact of how this top bit works. When you get to the um, middle level, which is this level here, up the staircase from below, you have an ante room and you have a bedroom that faces out towards the streetway here. Um, and to, to its right, uh, it has a, sorry, a solid wall and doors that you don't see. There's, a, there's an outside room here contained, completely four rooms around it with a staircase up to the roof outside. So there's this outdoor, I think this is to do with winds and climate that, 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 that it's a really important element of this house. I don't know why it's done this way, but it's definitely importance attached to it. When you're on that terrace, you can then go up onto the big terrace right on the roof, right at the top above. Um, a view of it perhaps makes what I've just been talking about slightly clearer, seeing it from a distance, seeing it from the rear, seeing it closer to. Now I'm going to now look at this entrance bit here, which often the outside, you get no description at all of what it's going to be like. Um, balconies on there from the end. So the, the level with the room in the right is this level here with this obscured courtyard at this level, but the staircase up to the one above. And below here is the dining room and uh, more, more public rooms with these complicated planes on the outside at that end. Um, that's that at a bigger level. Um, showing you staircases going up, showing you the beautiful way that which all these elements are put together. It has been converted to a restaurant at some time in its history, this building. The view of the outside with the slabs sloping out. Um, right, now, now you can see, I'm going back to the plan, so you can show, see this terrace here with the staircase, and we're going to go up there. That's the terrace off from the bedroom with the slots in it, so you get these reduced views of the landscape outside uh, enclosed at the top. So it is a very private but very large roof terrace, and quite unlike anything you'd find in a lot of other people at this period. The staircase goes up one side of it, that's the view out from if you're in the, in, in the, in the bedroom, this terrace with a more open bit on, 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 on the end. Um, that's looking back the other way, the staircase to get it to fit within the spectrum space, the risers and treads change on this wall and go down, but they're all done in a straightforward, very simple, deliberate way. And then up to the roof where again, your views are restricted. I'm reminded a bit of Marseille, buildings and landscape, and roofs, roofs. Um, and the view the other way of this very large roof terrace right on the top. Um, view of that, the view of the emotion. I, I, I think it's a very, uh, very interesting, but I don't know the reasons for all these things um, because I'm an architect and I'm just looking at it as a building, but um, it, it's, not quite, uh, it's not quite what it seems to be. Right, now going to the last one um, we're going to talk about this evening. This is the, uh, the Casa del Fascio, which Judy has already mentioned. Uh, the quotes I have got here are, are from, uh, that it, it was controversial at the time that it was done. So these are, are, are things that people said about it at the time. Um, some, you know, people who loved it, the most purest interesting million of them, uh, uh, or they denounced it um, as being completely, um, uh, decadent and not true to it. So, so it aroused this controversy, but the reality of this building um, is, again, uh, first of all, before Terrelli came to do it, we, we know that he's absolutely familiar with Como as a place, and it's lo in the location of the building in relation to the old city, and in particular, the cathedral here. The site for it is just here. Had been, they'd done in their studies after the same thing of these various little bits and pieces inside the, the, the grid, uh, where they they'd carefully contextually designed buildings which didn't get built, um, uh, came to play when bringing in. So the, the, the Casa de Fesio comes in as the pure cube, can't be more pure architecturally than a cube uh, in relation to the um, cathedral, um, in relation to how the light you've seen with the other buildings, how important it was where he used models to make sure that the, 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 how the light reacted to different parts internally um, of, of the building. And that formally in terms of, of circulation or axis from circulations, you notice that, that within the Casa del Fascio, you enter it on the side where there is an open courtyard. And again, it's a U-shaped building like the little school, um, but, uh, <laughs> but completely the other way around <laughs> um, because this is the most open and democratic of, of pieces of architecture you could imagine. Um, you know, it, it's opening itself to the town that it's in. It's opening itself to the other, the major cultural and architectural feature of the town, the cathedral, 
uh, opposite and adjacent to it. And, and these, are, these are, I think, these are Peter Eisman diagrams describing what I've just said to you in words. Um, uh, here's, here's a view that will show you how this. Here, here's, here's the Casadeo Fascio, uh, the cube, the void. The, 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 it, it's the most beautiful of little cities, is, is, is uh, Como. The scale of the, of the block to the, to the wall, to the outside, to the landscape outside, uh, you can't ask for a better place to have a, put your building. And here is this magnificent building that's put in it. Um, uh, Zevi describing it. Um, here we go with the proportions and how everything is fitted together. Um, here a, a view with the street, probably as it looked early in the sun. I mean, when I went there, the, the street had become a street. It was landscaped and the thing itself was covered in uh, mobile phone aerials. Um, uh, and you don't see it like that. Uh, this is the reverse view of that further away, again, emphasizing the, 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 the sort of beautiful purist um, proportioning which people have gone on about and studied at length of the way the walls are handled within the frame in relation to the rooms inside and in relation to the proportions and the scale of the thing outside uh, and this sort of photo shows how right it is and was. Uh, yes, it has a fascist eye view of <laughs> how they probably wanted it. Um, you can't get everybody in but everybody is there doing their stuff. Um, there's a line there for the road. When you go there now, I mean, that's what, what you see more. This is an impossible image. Uh, gone is the fascism. Um, uh, people have photographed it in different ways. Here you can see, again, in this one, in terms of human scale, people in relation to the, the proportions and the orthogonicity of it. Um, famous drawings of that. Um, earlier pictures of that. Um, a section to show that the cube is not as simple as it appears. Um, again, the, the, the entrance of the U-shaped space that goes up, um, on each level, you actually have a different relationship internally. On, on, on the main entrance level where, where you come in, um, there's a double height space for two, two levels. On the level above, there's the top bit of the door, but there are these enormous beams that span across in the middle. So your, your view and relationship is different from the floor below. When you get to the third floor, there is a bridge where you walk across. Again, the space changes. Uh, and on the fourth floor, you're completely separate. You, you, you're, you're communing with what's outside the building more on the fourth floor. So in section, it, it, it does the most you can do within a section uh, in terms of, of, of relationships. Um, you can play games with lights if you've got a blank wall and a portioned wall. Um, going in the entrance, uh, it has, you have to have doors for the entrance. Um, uh, at the time, it has these folding doors, no sliding doors, but every single door in that batch there can open. So you can, you can, you can I suppose bureaucratically, you can limit the number of doors to your bureaucratical disposition as to how you let people in and out. But we look at a picture of that. Um, there are the doors, incredibly thin modern joinery. Um, that's open to the city. The city is open to come in. You open all the doors, the space flows from what's now this road outside into the space that I've described to you in section. But the, 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 the entrance is, is beautifully handled in terms of light and how you feel this space uh, from the outside to the inside. You have a, a portico bit on the outside, a bit of shading through the door. It's slightly bright from above, slightly darker, reorientate yourself, you're inside the building. It's a magnificent entrance. It's just a drawing of all that. Um, the use of materials, this is, um, this is a balustrade, okay? A real piece of glass. When, when Julie was talking about materials, you, you, you do get in Italian, all work of all periods, this, this absolutely um, understanding of the qualities of materials. And here's a magnificent modern understanding of the qualities of glass. Right, and the balustrade. Um, again, balustrades, you can see here the internal space in the middle, the different things that happened at the, at the different levels. Here you can see the main room with uh, a reproduction of the mural by Radici with, uh, with um, uh, Mussolini in the middle of it. Um, Tirani himself actually painted, he did quite Novocento paintings of himself in uniform, all rather serious and rather heavy. Um, again, the use of, of uh, modern cliche material, if you like, glazed bricks. Um, in, in partitions on, 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 to give you partial light, partial vision as you pass through it. As you move up the building, uh, you do get these views of the cathedral that uh, on, on the side that it's at, it's carefully opened up so that you can 
See, and, 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 and within the grid, uh, you get fairly simple disposition of circulation and office spaces. Um, top roof and a, a composed, well, for, for relaxing, I think, um, when you're not being a bureaucrat, uh, uh, but the cathedral and the context. Uh, circulation spaces and architecture plans, the proportions of the windows outside, the depth within the depth of the wall, the variety of things. You know, Eisenman has drawn these to bits, uh, but why not? Um, transparency. This is a very young Italian architect, early 30s, um, in staircases. So, turning a corner on a staircase. Um, uh, th this is a quote from Zevi, actually, that I'm sort of ending with. Um, uh, it, uh, no, sorry, it's not. It, 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 it's from uh, uh, Bruno Zevi's book, but it's an extract from a writing when, when he was when he, when he was an artillery officer uh, uh, in the, on the Russian front. He, he kept on drawing, and designing, um, uh, and he wrote as well. And, and, and he wrote this architecture, a measure of civilization, elementary, rising clear perfect when it becomes the expression of people who select, observe, appreciate the result, which laboriously reworked reveals the spiritual values of all. And there he was suffering from what we today, I think we'll probably call post-traumatic stress. Um, I don't know, but he, he but shortly after returning, um, uh, and he was about to get married, uh, in 1943, he died. Um, I th think that's the end of my bit of talking. Um, uh, I hope uh, we're now going to, yes, we've got a little bit of time. We can do questions which we have got in, in the chat uh, and a little bit of time at the end to say what our future things are. Um, so you've got a question from Abe. Abe, yes. In the chat box. I can't read it. Could you, okay, can you so read it? The question is, um, with such a link between rationalism and fascism, would you consider that the modern movement itself has elements of fascism even unto today? Uh, Corbusier was known to support fascism and much of white architecture symbolized the colonization of other co countries. Um, perhaps Judy? Fine, yep. Yeah. Um, am I unmuted now? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, I, th I think there's a bit of an, um, an overgeneralization. And I don't think there's actually a link between rationalism and fascism so much. I mean, it, when the rationalists are wanting to work for the fascist government, it's simply they're wanting to work for the government at a point when uh, Mussolini has still got a Jewish mistress, for instance. And um, it's a case of where are you going to get your commissions from? We're talking about the 1930s after the 1928 you know, uh, 1926, 1928, the great crash. There's not much work out there. Um, and certainly in the North, most architects are not, most of the rationalist architects are not getting jobs with the fascist government. Um, and particularly after um, the exhibition, um, down in Rome where they write very provocatively and say that they should be getting the um, the commissions rather than Piacentini and his friends. From that point on they're very much sidelined um, and that most of their commissions from then on are actually the private sector, um, either lots of flats or private houses. And so, or, or you know, Adriano Olivetti, who was very much anti-fascist. Um, and a, a large proportion of the rationalists ended up in the resistance. So um, earlier on, when fascism is more of, I would say, probably a general patriotic trend in Italy, um, then they, they, as very patriotic Italians, um, are wanting to support the state. 
and are wanting to get a commission from the city. I think one has to remember, yet again, that Italy did not exist as a state until 1860. So when you are talking about 1930, you're not talking as in Britain about a, an entity or as in France even, a, an entity, a governmental entity, which has existed for a long while. Um, that's one thing. Corbusier known to support fascism. I think that's a very overgeneralized and mistaken um, interpretation. Um, he was Swiss. He was incredibly naive. He turns up, he moves permanently to Paris in 1917 and is surprised to realize that the First World War is going on and is near to Paris. He is surprised to hear at that point that um, cannons going off within earshot of Paris. He did not realize. He comes from a neutral country. Um, his brother, um, he, yes, his brother, Albert, is even more naive, never bothers to get French nationality when the Second World War breaks out, just has to go back to Switzerland because he, he's, you know, um, a person no longer after in France because he doesn't have French nationality. Corbusier, when the war breaks out, he in the same way, like many architects, was looking for work. And he doesn't really seem to have realized what was going on. And I would not say he was really um, very closely linked with fascism. He goes down to, um, to Vichy, like a lot of other people do. But once he gets down there, um, he's disillusioned pretty fast and goes back to, to Paris. Um, and in a way, you could say that Pierre Jeanneret, who's his, his cousin, who's known for joining the resistance during the war, is in a sense almost as, as naive. He ends up in Grenoble because his lover Charlotte Perrion has gone there, so he goes to join her. Um, he goes there rather than to, he goes briefly to Vichy. He goes down to Grenoble um, to join Charlotte. I think for personal reasons rather than political ones. And I think it, it's very easy for people in Britain to be much more critical. But I think one needs to remember, for instance, that the RIBA lobbied the British government to prevent Jewish architects being given permission to come to Britain on the grounds that there was already unemployment amongst the, in the profession for British. Therefore, we did not want to have um, any foreign architects coming and potentially taking jobs. And that was why there was the legislation which said that anyone coming from abroad could only work as an architect in Britain if they worked with an, a registered British architect. Why you get uh, Gropius working with Fry, for instance. Um, why you get um, Jemayev working, uh, 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 who is it who works with Jemayev because Jemayev had got British. Uh, anyway, you know, it, so I think it's easy from where we stand in hindsight to criticize people. Um, it was not such a black and white situation. It was very much gray. And I think most people were in the muddy gray in the middle. Um, but I think the Italian situation was particularly complex. Um, and as I say, mo most, of, most of the rationalists or a large percentage of them ended up very actively on the anti-fascist side. I, I think it's very easy for people to not realize how, how quickly things are slipping into fascism. Um, living in France, I look at what's happening in Britain and the idea that asylum seekers are going to be sent to Rwanda, it, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. And things slip in. Yes, I, uh, if, to try and do questions, if anybody would like to ask, could you raise your hand? And Tom can then see you and we can try and organize answers. I can see William is waving, he's gingerly moving one finger. <laughs> can I be heard? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much um, for these presentations. I must say that 
Um, I've never seen uh, pictures of the the villa um, by Terenu, uh, and, and least of all in that kind of detail, showing that outdoor room and the quite incredibly sophisticated transformations of ideas from Corbusier and from here and there, um, but coming out with something totally fresh and, uh, and extraordinary. Um, I, I think Judy's right, it's extremely complex, the, uh, <clears throat> the archipelago of, of uh, situations uh, politically and architecturally in Italy in, in, the, in the 30s. On the other hand, the, um, you, you know, I, I think that uh, th there's been a sort of strange uh, series of historiographical shifts over 60 years. Um, uh, there was a period where someone like Gropius, uh, but like Gideon, could not possibly admit the existence of uh, Terenu, uh, you know, because he was a fascist architect. Uh, then we sort of get a sort of strange um, uh, schizophrenia of approach between the formalism of Eisenman, who tries to uh, depoliticize completely uh, Terenu, and uh, the tendency to treat the traditionalists, Le Piacentini, as that's fascist architecture. For heaven's sake, Tarani believed in the fascist dream. <laughs> uh, he believed in the Mediterranean uh, universalism of Mare Nostrum. He believed in uh, the power of antiquity to be revived through modern form. Uh, he was a convinced fascist in that sense. Uh, when, it, you know, the, the problem is we, you know, we don't find it so easy to admit um, that fascism was a modernizing program of another kind altogether, just as it was going to be in Spain in the 50s, like figures like De La Sota, um, you know, they, they thoroughly believed in, in, in this as a, a, a modernization program for their country after the uh, Spanish Civil War. So uh, there is a lot of retrospective um, uh, judgment and I think confusion. And a figure like Moretti, I, I sent you the article I did only less than a year ago on the, the Fencing Academy, which is an absolute masterpiece, I think uh, to me as interesting as the Casa del Fascio. Um, you know, the, the program, uh, the, the aims were all very clearly to do with the creation of an elegant military elite uh, bringing people up from all uh, uh, aspects of society into this kind of balletic interior, uh, a palace, uh, something beautifully placed in relation to the uh, imperial forum, you know, the word itself, imperial forum. And it was a distillation of many, many classical traditions through abstraction. Uh, you know, Moretti believed all this. I mean, and uh, I have to say something else. It's interesting in terms of your very interesting presentation of the Casa del Fascio, but missing is the huge um, image of, of the Duce, which was uh, destined to be on that blank facade. Uh, there are pictures of that showing, but of course that's been sort of on the whole cleansed, uh, uh, you, you, you might say. So um, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, if, looking back, uh, it's the danger of all historical retrospective judgments, but looking back from the Second World War, from obviously the position of the um, defeat of, of uh, uh, fascism, um, one risks a, a great deal of, of uh, misunderstanding. And Corbusier had a, an extremely complicated uh, vision of politics. I don't think he was as naive as Judy's making out, but uh, that would be another very, very long discussion, which we shouldn't get into here. But what I, I appreciate in, in Philip's presentation is the, just in a few words, the ability to evoke the architectonic qualities of the thing seen. And my goodness, this sophistication of of volume, of, of voids, of transparency of material. There's not one millimeter wrong in those, in those buildings. And uh, what a tragedy that this person was, was lost. But that lightness, on the other hand, you know, there are all these grand man monumental projects like the, uh, uh, the Danteum. I don't know, if, I, didn't, I came in halfway through. Did you talk about the Danteum? Well. No, no, I, I, I didn't because, uh, uh, it, it, it isn't built. <laughs> uh, it was a project. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, I read the books on it, Shoemaker's book on it. No, but the uh, point is, it's an absolutely imperialist emblem. Yeah. It's drawing together Egypt, Rome, 
uh, the the you know the inferno. I mean, a whole range of extraordinary um, epic stories, if you like, uh, integrated into this thing, which is then inserted in the in the uh, the ruins of of Rome. There you have it. Uh, and then his uh, the the project for the the giant palace of Congress uh, with a porf porphyry facade. I don't know, you know, two hundred meters long, using granite from southern Egypt. I mean, you know, the ambitions are pretty clear. Uh, this this whole thing came to a, a sort of quick end. Um, I happened to be involved in a marvelous thing four years ago in Matera when it was the the, the capital of European culture. Uh, and seeing Italy from the south up uh, and the importance of Toronto, the importance of the address towards the, uh, the, the Adriatic. And, have, and, it's, and I've just finished and it occurs to me, this might be of interest to Doc Momo, uh, putting together a presentation on um, a constant, a, a, a monument uh, and memorial by Ravnica on the island of Rab in the Adriatic, marking the spot of an Italian concentration camp. Um, and uh, a great work, 1953, uh, the, the, the uh, a sort of abstracted uh, ruins. So somehow it's on my mind what Italian attitudes were uh, towards uh, uh, their, 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 their neighbors and their ex-neighbors. And it was a straight, brutal uh, uh, aspect of fascism. You see, the story got cleaned up because in the, um, or laundered, because in the post-war, uh, struggles against communism, uh, the likes of Churchill and so forth, insisted that 2,300 Italian war criminals not be judged. You know, the game had changed. There had to be, and, and Italy has kind of cleaned up its own memory in a quite extraordinary way to not examine whole areas of that murky uh, past. So there's a lot of work for us historians, and there's a lot of work for Italian historians in the archives, actually, to get further into this. But out of this comes this sub sublime architecture uh, with this actually, you know, universalizing vision of civilization. That quotation is very moving. There is a spiritual quality to, to Randy. Isn't it complex, this thing called architecture? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you both very much. It's stimulating. When, when is this going, this tour you're going to do? Uh, it's from, I was going to say at the end, it's from... It, it's, it's the last two days of September and the first two days of October. But oh. we need names finalized by Thursday lunchtime because I then have to actually give specific names nowadays in order to get people into Casa del Fascio. Are you all staying in dormitories or...? or, or... No, 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 the usual, <laughs> usual uh, um, um, modus, um, which is that uh, we tell you where we're going to meet and we tell you what we're going to do, but then um, it's up to you to find your own transport and accommodation. Uh, oh, okay, right, right. And so people it's, can, can do it according to their own budgets. So it's sort of meet, meeting, uh, yeah, some people drifting over from the five star, whatever, and others are coming out of the camping site. Uh, and that's uh, in the youth hostel, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, James, <laughs> James, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yes, I mean, thank you very much both for you know, for me, fascinating presentations. Um, I mean, I thought about uh, Tyranny's, I, I, I mean, he may have had fascistic meanings, but you could say that his copying of the uh, workers' club of Golosov and uh, the Novokomum, he was also had, um, uh, you know, communist leading, leanings. I mean, probably like most young men, he had divergent views. And I, I was thinking when hearing of him being on the Russian front, you know, what did he think about that? Because with his evident enthusiasm for at least the constructivist work, so he, he may have had um, uh, imperialistic leanings, and but he also had uh, constructivist leanings. And I think that is very plain in all these buildings, the lightness uh, and transparency of them. And another parallel that just occurred to me while this was going on was, but this is rather irrelevant, but whether um, Putin's invasion of, um, of uh, Ukraine slightly reminds me of Mussolini invading Abyssinia. <laughs> I mean, somebody who, who isn't totally without merit somewhere in, the, in their work, but can nevertheless embark on a, a, a vainglorious um, 
and and let's hope disastrous <laughs> um, uh, grandiose invasion of that kind um, so that's uh, that's uh, yeah. Curtis, you want William? You wanted to come back? Uh, may I? Sorry. Yes, do. No, I think it's very interesting, but I think the the parallel is with the Italian invasion of of uh, of Yugoslavia because um, we're dealing with unresolved issues from the First World War. Just as actually, there's nothing to condone the monstrosity of Putin, but there are a huge number of unresolved issues about identity and border zones and transitional zones uh, on the east and western ends of, of, of Ukraine and, and of Poland and of Germany come to that. And uh, these, are, you know, you think in a world of supermarkets and uh, people going on holidays and whatnot, that that's all gone. But then these, these uh, nightmare ghosts come back to the surface uh, and are, are exploited. But the Italian invasion of, uh, of Yugoslavia was to reclaim things that, which they felt they had lost. Uh, it was also a, a straightforward ethnic cleansing. Uh, they, they had a racist attitude towards the Slavs. Uh, interestingly enough, the 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 camp, uh, you know, that I've been investigating with the help of people who who uh, you know use uh, Serbo-Croat and can read the documents, um, had two camps. It had one for uh, the Slavs who were in tents and were dying like flies, and one for Jews who were treated actually rather well and who were referred to as the protectivi rather than the repressivi. So there's some very interesting and curious things going on uh, when it comes to all these uh, maneuvers in that, in, in that period. But what I wanted to say is that it's the ambiguity of, of history uh, so that the, the, the Russians, the Russophile communities in Ukraine are very easily exploited to follow the line that this is somehow still part of Russia. You could say the same thing about Kuwait, the invasion of Kuwait vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iraq and so on and so forth. So in, in a world of fractured boundaries and with a, you know, uh, America setting a fabulous precedent for breaking the international rules <laughs> of engagement by invading Iraq uh, uh, illegally, that uh, sets a perfect precedent for, for, uh, for Putin to do what the hell he likes. I mean, everybody's getting on their high horse now, but, uh, you know, I'm sorry, there a lot of things have been laid in place by absolutely stupid Occidental behavior. Um, anyway, there's no excuse for what's happening. I, I, we, we, we agree. But um, I, do think, I don't think you can say just because uh, uh, an architect is looking at things in one ideological wave band that he's identifying with the ideology. Uh, Tirani used his eyes. He looked at Holland, uh, at uh, Lokobuze, He looked at uh, Van Duisburg. He looked at Golosov, but he was a convinced fascist. And he also thought you don't do the official headquarters of the Casa del Fascio, <laughs> uh, you know, because you're sort of uh, really deep down a communist. You know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 let's let's be clear. You know, th th this was an optimistic uh, ideology that was trying to save Italy from dissolution. That's what they were thought they were doing. Uh, they used brutal tactics to do this. But you know, uh, I'm afraid to say that nations do use brutal tactics. The British Empire was not exactly a, a Tea Party, as far as I can remember. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, is it, is it, James, were you? No, you. Did you raise your hand again? No, no. No, okay. Well, we're coming, coming. Oh. You know, um, I think, I think what we've had actually is contradiction and complexity within modernism this evening. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, and I think on that note, we'll sort of bring it to an end. Is that is, is that all right? If if I could just tell you what we're up to next. Well, uh, can I? Can I? Sorry. Maybe, yes. Yes. Go on. Go on. We so rarely have contact. I do hope yes. to get to London eventually, but when it's not overrun by. Uh, coronavirus or 110 degree temperatures or whatever. But uh, it would be so nice to be in the same room and chat. And, yes, uh, yes. And, and all the rest. But what I wanted to say, there's a larger issue here about ideology and architectural form. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. um, you know, the, the, a work of architecture, in, in my view, can emerge around within a field of ideological beliefs. But the more profound the work, the more it has a strange capacity to transcend that original situation. And the, the, that's where the autonomy, if you like, of architecture begins to play in. 
but it's a risk to take the autonomy argument too far, which is what Eisenman did. He turned it into a formalism, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and just, you know, treats it with a, uh, a, a lacquer of structuralist thinking and God knows what, non his usual nonsense. But, you know, but it's basically, he turned it into a kind of linguistic formalism, which helped him to understand architecture. Not enough, apparently, but anyway, that's not <laughs> And, 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 you know, that's where the autonomy goes too far. And anyway, the version of autonomy there was just grammatical. It was not essential in terms of the aura of the work or the idea of the work or even the subtle uh, uh, articulation which you, in a few words, uh, conveyed. Uh, but, you know, what I wanted to say is that this, there is, without the ideology, you wouldn't have had the building. Without a, a poetic interpretation and idealization of those institutions of fascism, you wouldn't have had the building. On the other hand, those things on their own do not give you the building. You know, then there's the, spring, the springboard into architectural invention, but they all are interconnected through complex chains, I would say. Anyway, so, sorry, yeah, back to your, your itinerary. Oh, no, no. I was going to say, uh, Abe, uh, you asked the question. I, I haven't got a picture of you, so I don't know whether your hand's up, but do you, having heard all that, do you want to make any comment? No. 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 <laughs> no, no it's been very stimulating. I'd love to go back and see these buildings and see other buildings. So uh, perhaps you could send me an email with your itinerary, Judy. Would that be okay? Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to say thanks for a very, very interesting and fascinating evening. Um, uh, the question I asked was related to um, a book uh, that I read, which was by an Israeli architect called White City and Black City uh, by Sharon Rothbard. Mm -hmm. And he goes into the whole ethos of um, Israel, uh, Tel Aviv's White City mm -hmm. and the roots of it, um, whether it was Bauhaus, whether it could be the national architecture of uh, Tel Aviv and Israel, and and then he goes into the roots of um, you know uh, colonization, the use of white buildings in uh, you know Corbs buildings in, in Algiers, and um, and he relate he says that uh, white buildings and that sort of white architecture is also a kind of an instrument of um, colonization, and we talk about the colonization of Palestine and uh, who actually built uh, a lot of these white buildings were actually Palestinians, even though the um, ethos of Zionism was to have only Jewish uh, builders and Jewish um, workers, you know, they wanted to exclude Palestinians. And in fact, it was the Palestinians who actually built a lot of the white buildings. So it's a very interesting discussion on um, you know, uh, how people interpret architecture and uh, modernism. And um, and uh, they, they said that Corb's things about health and, well, you know, the healthy thing and in the rooftops and, you know, were also sort of an instrument of um, the kind of a fascistic um, approach to um, life and uh, things like that. It's just a fascinating discussion. And I wanted to thank you for- <laughs> Okay, then not at all. No, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, William. No, I, I, th I think it, the, the roots and all the rest of that, you know, is part of white genism, isn't it? And um, the idea of white buildings at that period certainly is linked with hygiene, etc. But also that particularly um, in Algiers, Corbusier was very much inspired by, he, again, by his looking at the vernacular architecture there and looking at the Mazab and things of that sort. Which, and similarly, a lot of the inspiration that the modern movement drew from Mediterranean vernacular, um, particularly uh, Greek, etc., um, it was looking at buildings which were whitewashed. It was it was not that they were white in an ideological sense. They were they were white because that was what was naturally there: white stone or whitewashed, whatever else. And, and you do that for practical purposes, partly hygienist, but also to reflect the sun. It's part of, of this development of vernacular within a climatic context. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant, yes, get on. Yes, um, you know, I wanted to say the, 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 there's a figure who's absolutely essential in all this discussion, which is Mendelssohn. Um, mm -hmm. Because when Mendelssohn goes to Palestine, um, he is appalled by the kind of cliches of European modernism he sees everywhere in Tel Aviv. 
And his approach to the whole thing is deeply involved with the reading of climate, place, and history, including Arab history. Mm -hmm. And his vision of, of, uh, of Zionism is an inclusive vision. He talks about the unity of the Semitic peoples. Uh, of course, it's not awfully popular uh, with uh, certain, <laughs> certain members you can imagine, but he also has a, a Mediterraneanist ideology. Uh, he and Ozonfor tried to set up in 1933 an academy of the Mediterranean in the south of France. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, look, the search for these certain sort of archetypes of the patio and so on, and of course the vernacular, but not the white vernacular in the case of uh, of, the, of, of, of Palestine, but the stone uh, houses, which he, he sketches and draws, um, but also uh, his, his deep interest in the urban structures of Jerusalem uh, and the Hadassah Hospital, in my opinion, which is a great masterpiece, is a kind of uh, emblematic inclusion of all these things with the three domes referring to the three great books of monotheism and the pond in the middle of Revelation. You know, there's a mystic, you know, he's a great architect and, and this sort of mixture of rationalism and mysticism. So he doesn't go and dump, you know, what he's been doing in Germany uh, or, or even on, on the, you know, at Bexhill on sea uh, uh, on the Middle East. He goes and, re and reacts to the climate, the place, the stone the, and everything else. And actually he's in, in great tension. He was very criticized for being so interested in Arab architecture. Anyway, it's a long, long story, but anyway, there, there we go. Now we're really getting going. <laughs> yes, yes, we are, but I think I think I have to be a chairperson and <laughs> do I've been there a long, long time. Uh, I, 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 yeah. that, which is that yes. the British um, colonial architecture in Palestine in the twenties in particular, yeah. Um, demonstrates a deep research into Arab architecture and yeah. understanding, and in a sense, Mendelssohn's taking off from there. Um, and you find this um, with Ashby going out and, and laying down the regulations which persist on, it's still for Jerusalem, that everything must be built in local stone, for instance. Uh, just one minor thing I'd like to just a, a correction is of course, most of the poor buildings were not necessarily white. A lot of them are actually designed to be coloured right from the beginning. In particular, you see that at Pesach, um, mm. and you see it. You see it in, in most of them actually. They were not white, but they were. He he was not visiting white buildings on the whole. Good. Okay, uh, the, I think for me to wind it up, I just had to point out our, 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 our future. We're going to be quite parochial. The next two events we're doing, um, but while. Hopefully, while it's still summer and a reasonable sort of summer, we want to do another uh, walking tour. Uh, and a few years ago, we did one while he was still alive of George Finch's work in Lambeth, where we only touched part of it in that period. And since then, we've been researching it some more. And we're going to do uh, a more extensive George Finch work to show actually how his within uh, a public office uh, in a period in, in, in a building type that was very much taken for granted uh, he developed uh, over a period of time so we're going to build up that piece of parochial history the, the other bit of parochial history we're going to do is um, we wanted to do work on Nyan's Israel and Ellis not only because of what they did but because of all the people who went through that firm and what they went on to do and we've got in touch with Tom Ellis who's the John Ellis, who's the son of Tom Ellis, uh, uh, who uh, uh, is um, practicing now in, in uh, San Francisco um, and is uh, writing a book and has the, the arco of, of the firm. But he's going to be in um, London uh, in late September and he's agreed to come and give us a talk for that, which we're going to, we're trying. We've approached the old Vic Annex because we thought it'd be rather nice to do a talk in the old Vic Annex, which was a building that at one time was much talked about um, uh, uh, where he could talk about their work. If not, it will be um, at Cowcross Street and, 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 and by Zoom. Um, uh, those are the, anyway, there are other things where we're, we're plotting and praying, but those are the two immediate ones. Well, I will do you Lasden eventually. You will, I know, yes. I didn't want to mention <laughs> it, I didn't want to be a hostage to fortune. <laughs> but, you know, I, think, I think I'm going to insist on a change of government. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As a, as a condition, the trouble is what can change too, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, go to Strasbourg, you, couldn't we? Yeah, <laughs> if you do want to come to Milan and see some of these buildings, yes, you haven't already put your name down 
yes. I mean, with um, the some well, uh, I think it's to Tom, isn't it? That, that the names are going in that. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> by by next Thursday. By this Thursday. By this Thursday. Yes. Okay. I'll look at that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, this is very enjoyable as usual. Good. Thank you both very Good. much. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, I just wanted to. I mean, I'm interested in the Milan thing. It's it's been impossible for me to focus on it until now. But uh, do, am I, do I understand? I've got to say yes or no. Definitely by two days from now. Is that right? Well, I had you down as definite anyway, actually, James. But... Oh, you did. Oh, good. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> well, you see, but I'm not sure whether my wife is going to come as well and that sort of thing. So I'm, I, have... I, I think I need to put her name down. Because otherwise they won't let her into the capital fashion. I see. So well, I see. Well, and if she can't come, we'd get somebody else. In. Well, yeah. it is the name. Then I have to give them the precise name. It never used to be like that. Last time I went with sixty students and no names in the class, but now. If, if, whose benefit do you have to put all these names? I didn't hear that. Sorry. For the Casa del Fascio. Oh, I see. For the Casa del Fascio. <laughs> <laughs> Which is now the the finance police. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, gosh. I'm not sure. OK, what... well, yes, put us both down then. Have you got Have you got my wife's name or not? I don't know. Uh, hey. I think Tom has. Yes, I know. Jane. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Jane. Jane. Yes. OK. OK, but well, I think we've got to the point of saying good night and thanks for... Yeah. All right, good night. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thanks. Arrivederci. <laughs> I didn't. I, oh well. Anyway. No, go on. <laughs> I didn't. I'm not going to start it now. But this discussion of European architecture in in mm. Algiers, and uh, I didn't bring up Goldfinger's contribution to that, and his six months there, or in 1929, when he designed a number of social projects for Senator Kitoli, who is the sort of leading. Um, liberal thinker about polit of European involvement in Algiers, and of course, whose wife then became the great uh, proponent of, of tapestries and, and made all the tap big tapestries for Corb and for, for, in fact, the Coventry Cathedral and so on. But, but Goldfinger's view of uh, the schemes that he designed in considerable detail for, for Kutoli in, in Algiers you know, we're, we're sort of still Perret influenced. In other words, they weren't white. They were um, they were um, concrete structure exposed. And uh, the, the main hotel project has terraces all the way around to give shade. Um, there were about three different hotel projects for Philippeville. The only thing, he, and there was a whole housing project that he built, which was specifically for the Arabic population, uh, um, which was showed a sort of Gropius-like influence. The only thing that actually got built out of all this was a monument to General Luto, who was a, a hero of left-leaning European um, um, population. I, I can't quite remember what General Luto did, but anyway, he was much um, uh, admired by liberal thinkers there. So, you know, there was that was a different uh, approach to how Europeans should build in in uh, uh, Algiers. Thank you. <laughs> mm. Okay. Sorry. Right, okay. No, thanks, James. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.